Thank you very much for the introduction, Kim. Um, and I just want to say I'm, I feel really privileged to be invited to present at, um, at ABES today about my career in agriculture, um, especially because I consider it to be quite short so far, but definitely not as short as Dominique's. <laughs> so I've had a quite a few more years of experience comparatively. Um, and so just before I start, I really want to say thank you to ABES for the opportunity to present today. And as well, before I go any further, I need to acknowledge that I have completely plagiarised the title of my presentation from Dr. Karl Kruzelnitsky, um, taking it from the title of one of his books. Now, I want to give you a, a brief outline of what I'm going to present about today. Um, and the reason for this is because uh, not only have I tried to make a presentation that hopefully is going to be engaging to everyone in the room, but I've also tried to make it um, engaging for, for the educators um, or the, the, the teachers and the students that are going to be listening in online. So hopefully it kind of draws everyone together and at least you find one interesting point to take home from the presentation today. Um, so for starters, I want to start talking about what, why I think um, agricultural education is important and one of the issues that we really face as educators in um, agriculture. I'll give you a bit of a brief rundown on how I actually ended up being here, like my, my career or my journey so far. Um, and then I'll, a few specific examples of work that I've done in, in science and agriculture. And then finally, I'll just touch on a couple of examples of other careers, you know, hopefully students out there can be um, interested in and engaged with. And as well, before I start my presentation officially, I just want to press, um, preface it by saying that um, uh, because I have an animal science background and I work in animal, um, animal physiology and animal welfare, I'm, I'm really using a lot of animal examples today, but all of the concepts I think really apply to agriculture in general, not just animal science. Okay, so um, with agricultural education at the moment, as I think Dominic ha has pointed out really well, we have a bit of an issue in um, attracting students into, into studying agriculture further at university. Um, mostly, I think this is to do, well, th I think this is actually really multifactored. It's got to do with that city-urban divide that we're, um, that we're seeing with populations becoming less aware of where their food's coming for, from and therefore less interested in where it's coming from. Um, as well as that, you know, we have a lot of competition with mining sectors and, and other sectors as well. But as educators, a lot of that is really out of our control. Um, however, I think that one thing we can do is, is help to inspire students at high school um, or, or younger as well, and as well as when they get into early, um, the early stages of university, to entice them into the degrees and to, and to keep them there. Now, one of the problems I think we have um, with agriculture or enticing students into agricultural degrees is that we're, we're quite unique agricultural and animal science degrees. We really like to kind of stand out from the flock, so to speak. Um, and this is because unlike degrees like veterinary science, teaching, nursing, it's not a specific professional degree in the sense that before a student starts it, they know what career path they're going to take when they finish that degree. Um, but, on, but conversely, compared to things like a general science or a general arts degree, agriculture and animal science is a lot more specific so we don't get, we don't encourage students that have more of that, you know, vast overview, like that whole, uh, I'm kind of interested in science, I don't know where to go, so I'll do a science degree rather than doing an agriculture degree. So I think we're kind of, we're sitting in that middle ground and I think that's, um, that's a little bit tricky. So one way that I think we can actually help promote what opportunities we have in, in agriculture is by using case studies and giving students examples of career pathways that they can choose. Um, at the moment, and I know I was told this at uni, one of the, um, you know, by doing an ag degree, it can literally take you anywhere. It's so broad and exciting. Your career opportunities are really only limited by your creativity. I think that's a huge selling point. But when I was a first year undergrad student, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I didn't even know what subjects I wanted to select in third year. Having the world as your oyster is really daunting. If you don't know what career opportunities are out there, how are you supposed to pick your subjects? How are you supposed to know which direction to go in? How do you know that these next four years are going to lead you to somewhere exciting rather than leading you, you know, on a wild goose chase and back as a check out chicken coals or something like that? You, you don't really know how, where it's going. So I really think that, you know, as educators, we can really encourage students by, by giving case, case studies of, of careers and, and pathways that you can follow in ag degrees. And that's really what I'm going to be doing today, using myself as an example. So um, now I just want to touch on how I actually ended up today from this small, um, very uh, enthusiastic animal lover to this slightly bigger 
animal lover in front of you. Um, I still have the same passion for sheep, but just a bit of a different wardrobe, thankfully. Um, so I actually get asked the question all the time how I ended up in this career because I'm, I'm not from an agricultural background. I'm from Sydney originally. Um, and so, it, so it's really common. And I actually also think that this... That, that the reason why people are so surprised, well, but people seem to be quite surprised that I decided to take an, agricu an agriculture pathway, um, even though I had had no exposure to it. And I think that that's something also that's really unique about um, ag science and, and studying agriculture, is that it's really all about the exposure that you've had prior to studying um, or prior to starting your degree. And that's really different to a lot of other fields. You know, if you want to be, um, if you want to do a, a business degree and you want to be involved in business, you don't have to be exposed to it previously in order to be encouraged to, to get into it. Whereas with agriculture, I think you get a bit more of a sense that, that you need to. So I think that that's another, another point we can be investigating. But anyway, so when I was at high school, I was really interested in, in animals and I also was really interested in science. Because I didn't know what opportunities were out there for me, um, I naturally thought that, that vet science would be the option. But the more I thought about it, the less and less it was actually suited to my personality and, and what I was interested in. So when I got to university, um, I, I enrolled in a Bachelor of Animal Science at Sydney University. And this was really my induction into agriculture. It's a very agriculture or production animal focused degree. Um, and, and I really loved it. I really liked the, um, the applied nature of everything that I was learning because it was helping to um, improve productivity of the animals and, and, um, and you know, create a bit of a feed base and things like that. Um, and it also gave me my first taste of research. And I think for any students out there that are interested in um, a research career, I would, I would really encourage you because research is just such an exciting field to be involved in. Not only um, do you have to have a really thorough understanding of the science behind what you're interested in, but you also need to um, be really creative because you're problem solving. So you need to come up with novel ways to address these problems that we have in science. Um, so after you know, my university degree, I really wanted to start to pursue a science, um, a science career or research career. And so I went on and did a PhD, um, postgraduate study, and I did it in animal welfare. And for me, that was the perfect combination because it's all of these exciting things about science, this problem solving, um, addressing a need that the industry has, um, as well as it's plenty of animals. So that was good. I was pretty happy with that. And essentially, that's how I've ended up in, in front of you today um, with a role that's 50% teaching, animal welfare and phys physiology, and 50% research. Okay, so I'm going to give you now just a couple of examples of the work that I've been doing in um, uh, the, the research that I've been doing as, as part of my role, as part of my PhD and, and following work. And I've to chosen two different examples because I think they kind of marry in um, science and agriculture quite well together, whereas usually it's really it can be a bit of a, a tough divide. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is some of the work that I've done as a part of my PhD. Now, um, as a part of my PhD, I was, I was investigating cognitive processing um, in, in sheep as a measure of their welfare. So, and I actually think that this is a nice, um, this is a nice example of how, as, as agricultural scientists, we can take examples from other areas of research, and in this case, taking it from human psychology, and applying it to problems that we have in agriculture. So that's really bringing in that sort of, that creative aspect of, of research that I was talking about. So when we're talking about, just a really brief overview, when we're talking about cognition, that's the processing of information. Now, how you feel or your mood really influences how you process information. And that's when, you know, um, as a human example, we're talking about being half glass full or half glass empty. So how you feel influences how you think about things. And this is what's known as, as cognitive bias. This, is this um, half glass full, half glass empty approach is what is known as cognitive bias. So, um, for an example, if you've had an excellent day at work, you've managed, or an excellent day at school, and you've managed to get really good feedback from um, your teachers or your boss, you managed to achieve all you set in the day, probably had a really good lunch, got to talk to some exciting people, you're in a really good mood. Then when you go home, and when you leave your job, you get in your car to go home, and you get stuck in a traffic jam, that neutral situation of a traffic jam doesn't really bother you. You're pretty happy. You might even take the um, opportunity to listen to some, you know, to listen to your favourite song on the radio. You're pretty relaxed about the whole situation. If you've had a really bad day, if you got in trouble, if you were late to your meetings, if you had to sit in some really boring lectures or presentations, and you're in a pretty bad mood, and you get stuck in that same traffic jam, you're really stressed. You're very anxious about it. 
everything's going wrong, you're going to throw your hands up in the air because you've had just such a horrible day. That's your negative mood influencing that same neutral situation. And that's what we're talking about with cognitive bias. And what's really interesting is the more research we do in this area, animals actually show us the same thing. So these same optimisms and pessimisms of an ambiguous situation based on mood has been shown in rats, in birds, in monkeys, in pigs, in sheep. All these different, all these different animals are showing this same human psychology you know, test that, that's really robust, which I think is really interesting. So I know you're all asking the question, how do you know if a sheep is optimistic or pessimistic? So because we can't actually find out, we can't actually ask the sheep, we need to kind of come up with an, ingen an ingenious way to, to measure this. Um, so first of all, we need to train the sheep to associate a positive location in their pen with a feed reward. So the sheep learn that when the bucket, the food bucket's in this corner and they approach it, they get a feed reward. Alternatively, they learn that when the feed bucket is in the opposite side of the pen and they approach it, there's a dog there waiting for them, looking very enthusiastic. So they learn the difference. They now have this positive and negative situation from which you can um, set up an, an ambiguous situation to ask them how they're feeling, so to speak. So to do this, you put the bucket in between and it's up to that sheep to judge whether or not the bucket at this location is um, more positive, so they're more likely to get a feed reward or more negative. And so an animal that is in a more positive welfare state is more likely to judge that as being um, this middle position as being positive and an animal that's in a more negative welfare state is more pessimistic. They're less likely to judge it as a food reward and respond that way. And I've actually, you know, as, again, as a part of my PhD, quite done quite a few experiments on this. And just a couple of examples is that we've actually shown that sheep that have been exposed to long-term stresses are more pessimistic in their judgment. Um, so one example of one of the treatments that we used was some um, unpredictable, unpredictable and aversive um, husbandry conditions. So as you can see in these photographs here, um, they're represented by uh, restraint or, or shearing processes, um, uh, movement with a dog, mixing with unfamiliar animals, just all these sort of disruptive processes that sheep don't like because they don't like to be disturbed. They're, they're pretty on the straight and narrow. Um, all these, just, you know, three weeks of this un unpredictable husbandry managed to elicit this same pessimistic um, judgment. And almost more importantly, uh, um, a pharmacological depletion of their brain serotonin had the same effect, leading to a more pessimistic judgment. Um, and so these two changes, or these two treatments, are generating that same um, uh, overarching pessimism that we see in, in people that have um, chronic, uh, chronic depression and diagnosed depression. So I think that, you know, this is just kind of a nice example of how we can use, like, like I said before, we can use um, techniques from other parts of research to answer questions that we have in agriculture. And this is where we're bringing in these, like, innovative ideas. Now, the second example I wanted to share with you today is kind of the complete opposite of that. Um, it's improving animal welfare in a really practical approach. And what we're doing, what I'm doing in this project, is I'm taking research that's been out there already in the literature. Um, this, we've got a huge body of animal welfare literature, and we're taking out the key points and delivering them to people um, in a training package on the ground to improve animal welfare. I'm actually doing this as a larger project that's been sponsored by MLA or Meat and Live Livestock Australia, um, to develop an animal welfare training program for the live export industry. Now, why is it important to develop a training program to start with? Well, in terms of animal welfare, um, a stock person, having a knowledgeable stock person, can eliminate almost all of the possible risks to an animal's welfare. If that stock person is familiar with their behaviour, knows how to handle them in the correct way and, and move them in the correct way, can easily identify um, when they're, or can identify earlier on when they're in a, a diseased state or injured, that's obviously going to have a huge impact on that animal's welfare. So with that in mind, we've developed this training program by, like I said, pulling out these key parts from the literature and applying it in a, in a very basic training program. Um, and it's in such an applied way that this training program can be delivered to people that are just, that, um, that, that are new to a feedlot in a developing country and that are, com uh, that are illiterate. So we're taking this science that we've got and we're applying it. And I think this is a nice example because in agriculture, where, um, at, where, you know, but the difference between science and agriculture research or an, an application in agriculture can be really quite vast, but this is a nice example of where we're starting to bring it together. Um, so just on, on the way this program is structured is that we're, we're covering all different aspects of the supply chain from the transport of animals through until their processing. 
um, as well as this overarching idea of animal handling. So looking at things like flight zone, um, pressure release and that sort of thing, as well as including things like how to reduce stress at transport, um, how to identify injury and disease early. Um, as a part of this project, we've done a, a pilot of the training program in Indonesia using both local Indonesian cattle um, and Australian cattle, and it's worked really successfully so far. In addition to that, just last week, um, I was in the Middle East doing the same program with sheep, um, and again, with these, these uh, guys that were either really experienced or we had some really, novel guys, um, really novice guys as well, and it was an excellent opportunity for them to sort of learn about animal welfare. And, um, and just being involved in this project has been really exciting because... Uh, everyone, uh, everyone I've spoken to, all those participants from managers of feedlots through to the, the guys that are handling animals every day are really excited to be involved and to learn about what animal welfare is and to, um, to, to get a bit of experience in it. And not only is it good for them to understand animal welfare, but it's also having huge, you know, it'll, it has the potential to have huge flow and effects to their productivity because they can understand how to move animals more efficiently. They're going to identify when they're in a, you know, a disease state and be able to deal with that um, faster and more effectively. So it's, um, that's been a really exciting project to be a part of. And then finally, just to wrap it up, um, for any of the students involved, I just wanted to kind of give you a couple of examples of some of the other amazing animal production jobs that are out there at the moment. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list, and when I say that, I mean I just ask my friends that did the same degree as me what they do. So it's, um, it's just a couple of examples. But I think it just goes to show that, yes, really, a, a career in, um, in agriculture has endless possibilities, but in order to get students enrolled in that pathway, we need to kind of bring it down a little bit and give them examples of where they can go. And hopefully, um, you know, as educators out there, you can... You can use examples of all these other jobs and any, all the other professions I haven't mentioned today um, as examples to encourage people into these agricultural careers. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. That's a very important point, just the uh, smorgasbord of opportunities.